So with that, let's go ahead and switch gears here and move over to SVS. So what I see on the screen now is the SVS homepage. This is what you see every time you launch the program. I'll go ahead and open this previous project here. And we now see the Project Navigator. This is a listing of spreadsheets or data nodes that exist within this project. There are also some nodes for genome browser windows and perhaps other visualizations. Let's open this first spreadsheet and get oriented a little bit with the data set. So this particular data set is a family trio. Although it's not annotated here, it could be annotated. The first two rows are the parents. The third row is the child in the trio. And in each column, as we move across, are genotypes as determined by the complete genomics workflow for analyzing the whole genome sequence. If I scan through to the far end, we can see that there are almost 5.3 million variant columns in this data set, including both insertions, deletions, single nucleotide variants, and small CMVs and substitutions. I can click the green map button and see all of the map positions here, as well as reference alleles for every variant. So, for example, here we see a position where one parent has a GG genotype. G is the reference allele based on the HG19 reference sequence. The other parent has a heterozygous AG call, and the child is also heterozygous. We see right next to that a position where there is, this one is actually quite interesting, um, there's an insertion event, or actually a deletion, sorry, where uh, we see a deletion in one parent and in the other parent, yet the child somehow seems to not have the deletion at all. So that may be an error in the alignment. It's really hard to tell without going back and looking at the raw data. So an easier way to visualize this is to look at a variant map in our genome browser. So give this just a moment, it will start drawing. Okay, so we are zoomed to a small region on chromosome 15. We see here three bands across our genome browser window, which correspond to the three subjects in our spreadsheet. We can see uh, that any area that is white indicates a position where the sequence matches the human reference genome. Anything that is colored indicates a departure from the reference. So if I go over here, I can see a key that tells me that any place I see green means that there is a G base observed as opposed to the reference. I can zoom in a little bit closer and find out more about it. So if I zoom into a smaller area here, we can see, for example, at this position that the reference allele is an A. What is observed is, in fact, a G. And we can also see in one of our annotation tracks that in dbSNP version 132, this particular variant has been previously characterized as an A to G change. If I undo that last zoom, we can also see nearby this is how a deletion is drawn. So this is a hemizygous deletion where the reference is a T, and in fact this subject does have one T allele, but on the other haplotype has a single base deletion. If I zoom out further again, we can also see different types of variants. For example, at this position, this is a single base insertion that is carried by all three of our subjects. Notice over here at the bottom left in the data console that any time I click on a feature in the genome browser, I get additional information about that feature. So um, just an example to show inheritance, we can see here is an example of one of the parents having a variant that is passed on to the child. So one of the really important things here is to notice the variant, or not, excuse me, not the variant, but the annotation tracks along the bottom of the screen. 
Right now I'm showing just a few simple annotation tracks, including a track defining segmental duplications according to UCSC as well as microsatellites from UCSC. I have this track showing common variant sites from dbSNP and gene tracks and a reference sequence track. We have available a large number of other tracks in our download server, but also you have the ability to create your own references and both use them in the browser for visualization, but also for analysis purposes. You can create tracks from any spreadsheet or import from a file. All you need to have is a genomic coordinate and some data point that you would like to include there. So let's talk more about how we can use these annotation tracks for filtering purposes. If we go back to our project navigator, we see here a list of steps that I have already followed, and I will just walk you through how they all work. So beginning from the original data set with just under 5.3 million variant sites, or sorry, 5.23 million, I can open that spreadsheet and from the select menu, I can choose to filter by annotation track. There are different types of annotation tracks, but one of the most general is a region track. And I can, for example, choose to filter out any markers that appear in a given track. So the track of the segmental duplications that I had drawn in the genome browser, or the track for microsatellites. If there are any variants at those places, I can easily remove them. And then I have the option to include markers upstream or downstream from that position. So what I have done with this particular data set was to begin by removing any of the variant sites that were within a segmental duplication or within 100 base pairs of a segmental duplication. And that removed just over 200,000 total variants. I then took a second step of removing any markers that were in or near a microsatellite. Again, segmental duplications microsatellites are known to interfere with appropriate alignment. And so that took out about 10,000 more variants. I then applied a filter to identify only the common SNPs, or sorry, only the rare SNPs that were in this data set based on dbSNP version 132 common track from UCSC, which captures all of the SNPs in their database with a population frequency of at least 1%. And after a filtering out all of those common SNPs, that removed almost 4 million of my variants, leaving me with just 1.39. The next step was to use 1000 Genomes Project Phase 1 data based on all of the populations. Of course, the Puerto Rican population is highly admixed, having representation from Europe and Africa and Native American populations, so it seems to make sense to use all populations here for doing this filter. But I compared the data to the variant sites from the Thousand Genomes Project and identified another about half million variants that are at least a 1% frequency in the 1,000 genomes population, taking me down to just over 800,000 variants remaining. The next thing I did was to run, let me open this spreadsheet where we just have our 800,000, but I ran this tool for variant classification. The classification tool asks you to select a gene track that identifies exon start and stop positions so that it can then identify the appropriate codons. And you also need to give it a reference sequence so it knows what the um, codons should be. And it proceeds to make uh, classifications of all variant types. Um, for genome-wide variants, it will determine whether they are coding, whether they're at splice sites, introns, exons, upstream, downstream of genes based on a specified base pair distance or if they're intergenic. And for coding variants, it will determine whether they are insertions or deletions, substitutions that cause a frame shift, perhaps they introduce a stop codon or remove a stop codon, 
and so on, and it will give all of these classifications. So let's look at what we found in these 814,000 variants that we have determined are quite rare, at least according to DBSNP and the Thousand Genomes Project. So the variant classification, so this is all of the variants, all of the 800,000. We can use our context-specific menu here on the column to get value counts. We can see, not surprisingly, that the majority are intergenic or intronic, so over 400,000, so well more than half, are intergenic, and only about 1,945 are in coding regions. If we then look at the coding variant classifications, and let me activate everything here so we can get a good count. The counts here show us that of our 1,947 coding variants, the majority, well not the majority, but a large number are synonymous variants. Some have unknown classifications, but there are also a large number that are either non-synonymous, there are a few frame shifts that were identified, some insertions, deletions, substitutions, and so on. So what I chose to do at this point in my analysis was to inactivate all of the synonymous and unknown variants and move forward keeping only the non-synonymous and the perhaps more dangerous variants here in my analysis. So after doing that, I'm left with about 1,300 variants for further analysis. So from that list of 1,300, I proceeded to run the SIFT algorithm as available within SVS. So it's also an annotation track for SIFT scores. Using this tool, I identified which variants, according to SIFT, are likely to be well tolerated. So even though many of the variant sites I selected out of this 1,300 were non-synonymous, some of them were still expected to be very well tolerated. So after removing the tolerant ones, I'm left with only 850 sites, or 849, excuse me. And so we can now look at our genome-wide variant map, and we only have 850 sites here as opposed to over 5 million. Now, it's still perhaps difficult to just look at this and immediately assess the nature of what's going on. So I applied a few more tools. One that I ran is this variant counts per gene, looking only at the heterozygous variants. So what this gives me is um, gene by gene, so I have a gene name here, I have my three subjects, a count of how many of these rare, non-synonymous, and intolerant variants are collected within each particular gene going along. So we see that it's most common for one of the subjects to have one variant, but rare to have many genes that they really collect in. But if we transpose that spreadsheet and then do some sorting on it, we can identify, for example, genes where one, sorry, both of our parents have one of these variants and the offspring has two. And again, we're only looking at heterozygous variant sites with this particular report. So here, this looks like two genes, but when we look at it closer, we find out it is two different transcripts of the same gene, UBXN11, where there are two heterozygous variant sites in the child and one in each of the parents. So we can go back now to our genome browser, and we can search that gene name, UVXN11, and jump right to it. And what we see is a gene where, in one of the parents, there is a single base variant over here. I believe this is about the eighth exon of the gene. And the other parent has a three base substitution so we can see here the reference being a GCC, which matches our reference sequence here, but that parent having an ACT instead, that was passed on to the child. So the result then is a child carrying a compound heterozygous mutation in this gene. If 
this child had a rare disease that appeared to be recessive in nature, this would be an excellent candidate gene for further follow-up. We can also look at other reports, other ways of collapsing the data. We can see, for example, 61 potential de novo mutation sites when we look at the total number of variants per gene, we see that there are 61 of, sorry, this is not per gene, this is actually individual variants, so this is not collapsed. There are 61 sites where our offspring has variants that are not observed in either parent, thus being potential de novo mutations or potential sequencing errors as well. Uh, moving on, we also can find that there are 12 loci that fit a simple recessive model where each parent has exactly one copy of the alternate allele and the child has two. And we can also see all the genotypes here. So most of these are either substitutions or indels. There's only um, one of them that is really a single nucleotide variant. So that gives you kind of a brief overview of some of the tools that are available for filtering and annotating genomic variants and for interactive exploration of the data.